Um, so hi, thank you all for coming. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about my research, research study that I did while I was living in Engineer um, for the past three months. And I've decided to call it Health Experiences of Women Living in Informal Settlements of Engineer. Um, a little bit about me, I'm from Seattle, Washington, and I recently um, completed my Bachelor of Arts degree in Anthropology from the University of Victoria. I'm very interested in medical anthropology and specifically understanding how um, social, cultural, political, and economic factors impact people's health and lives. Um, and one of the reasons that I was really excited to come to Korea was to learn more about community-based participatory research. In anthropology, we talk a lot about participatory research, and so I feel like I've learned a lot about the theory behind it, and coming here was a really great opportunity Here I have some of the 
um, some of the concerns that came up. Um, so often it was related to mosquitoes and water being stagnant and collecting garbage and the health impacts of cleaning drains, um, which many of them did themselves, and the mosquitoes, many of them were saying that they couldn't stay outside in the evening because the mosquitoes were too much. And another theme that came up was the impact of livelihood. So we talked to women from many different um, occupations, and many of them expressed some of the health issues that they've been having related to their livelihood. Um, and I think this is really important. This is like a, a huge topic and can be researched much more in depth in, within each different occupation. Um, but one thing that I was thinking about with this is that oftentimes switching livelihoods is not an option, especially for um, low-income communities and people. <coughs> so the negative health impacts that come up from livelihoods, um, people are talking about like having really severe back pain from sitting for too long. Um, manual labor was something that came up a lot that would, women would say was really hard on their bodies and had a huge impact on their health. And switching isn't really an option. Um, one of the women was suggesting that um, someone implement a, a skill developing center for women so that they can learn other skills, like they were saying weaving or sewing, so that they can avoid doing manual labor, um, which will be better better for their health and for their bodies. Um, and then mental and emotional health. I'm not, I wasn't really sure how to label this theme, but I just wanted to share this story that was shared with us. Um, so the participant was between the ages of 30 and 33, and she told us that she gets sick once a year for three to four days, and she's admitted to the hospital with stomach ache, hands and feet ache, body pain, nervousness, and anxiety. sister passed away from cancer and she also found out that her nephew had died one and a half months back. Since then she had been getting very bad stomach pains and she went to the hospital and was given medicine to help that she should take twice a day but she only takes it once a day when she gets the stomach pains because she doesn't have time in the morning. And the doctor has told her it may be due to lack of cleanliness or from eating something bad but she says this is not the case. The doctor is telling her something it's something it's not. So I think this kind of demonstrates how mental and emotional health is not separate from physical health and can be experienced. Um, you can't really, yeah, you can't really separate those two things out when you're looking at health. And it's really important to, I think, understand this and to know that people experience emotional health and mental health in different ways, um, and it maybe express it differently and talk about it differently depending on. And I think this is also another important area for more research to be done to kind of understood how mental and emotional health is experienced and understood and expressed and discussed and diagnosed. Um, we talked with the field animators and I shared my findings here and they were saying that for many of them, for the people that they work with, um, the support systems for when they're feeling any sort of negative way um, are usually limited to their friends and family, um, and so yeah. So they were saying they're not, they weren't sure about what sort of um, options are available in terms of uh, mental health and support for that. And then women's health was probably I think one of the biggest topics that came up in this. We, so we only talk to women, which is, all, which is a, something that I'll get into later in terms of limitations. Um, but many women talk to us about um, health concerns that were very specific to women. So there are physical health concerns. Um, many women talk about anemia, um, reproductive and men menstrual health, and uterus removal was also very common. Um, another uh, female-specific health concern that was brought up was um, kind of not being able to prioritize their own health because they were so busy, um, often with, as you can see with this um, quote that I put in here, um, many women had um, 
not enough time because they were busy looking after their children, taking care of their family, um, or cleaning. Um, this woman was saying that she had really bad pains because she had a knot in her uterus, and she was scared to go to the doctor because if they operated on her, she didn't know who would take care of her children. Um, and then this kind of leading into my next theme, um, there was also a lot of hesitation in going to the doctor um, surrounding like trust, uh, lack of female doctors. Many people said there weren't enough female doctors, and some women even shared negative experiences that were really scarring in terms of um, um, being kind of alone with male doctors and sharing uh, personal concerns and having to uh, remove parts of their clothing, and, and that was a really, um, that only came up a couple times, but I think that's something that maybe wasn't shared with us often. Um, yeah, so that kind of leads into my next, um, my next theme, and the last theme, which was healthcare, and this often came up when we asked about health, people would tell us what they did when they were sick, where they went, um, the barriers that they were facing in terms of healthcare. One thing that became very clear was that availability is not accessibility. So just because there were many um, hospitals and government hospitals um, around Edgemeer didn't mean that they were accessible to um, the people that we were talking with. So barriers that were discussed included time, um, not especially when women had families, they needed to stay and take care of their children, um, or work-related uh, barriers being at work all day. Um, distance was a problem, and often when government hospitals were um, free, it still cost money because of transportation. And then previous negative experiences, like I was talking about in the last theme, um, were also a factor that influenced healthcare decision making. Um, and one thing that became very clear to me, especially when we were interviewing the ASHA and the Anandamadi workers, was that they're very essential to identifying those barriers and helping women to um, overcome them or navigate around them depending on which barriers they face. So some of the offshore workers that we were talking to were saying that they, um, they would talk with women and kind of get an idea of what problems they were facing and what barriers they were, they were having uh, challenges with and then they would help them to get the health care that they needed based on those barriers. So some of them would accompany them to the hospital or the doctor if they were worried about going alone, or they would help find people to take care of their children while they went, um, or they would direct them to the, the hospitals based on cost or time or transportation. Um, so next steps, um, like I've been kind of saying, each theme is an important base for future research. Um, it was a very broad topic, and um, I'm hoping that this can kind of provide different areas where more research and work can be done in the future. And then one thing that I learned that people may already know, but this was um, something that really stuck out to me, was the importance of working closely with people who are working directly with the communities. Um, this whole research project wouldn't have been possible without the field animators who already had relationships with the people that I was talking with and were really essential in um, helping organize the project. And then, like I was saying about the OSHA workers and the Anamadi workers, um, just people who work directly with the communities were really essential in, in helping people get access to healthcare. Um, and then, I unfortunately, time was an issue and we were not able to organize meetings with um, some of the stakeholders, but that's something that I was discussing with uh, Anju and with my supervisors in the field. Um, that could be a, a good next step to discussing different um, health issues and gaps and where those can kind of come together. Um, so some of the limitations included the language barrier. This is my translator, Jarna, who was a huge help and she was more of a co-researcher than a translator. Um, another limitation was that we only looked at women, um, so I don't know what kind of health um, healthcare benefits are available to men, like in terms of the offshore workers and the underwater workers who only um, work with women and children mainly. Then the topic of health can be very personal at times. There are also time constraints, which I just talked about, and then Another thing is that we only went to settlements that were involved with PREA, so especially when 
looking at the theme of sanitation and health that may have changed in recent years through involvement with Priya, and that's something that I don't, I don't know because we didn't really have any, um, any interviews with people to compare. And then, so one thing, in one of my last interviews, a woman said to me, and we didn't actually end up finishing the interview, um, but she said, if you're just going to write and leave, what is the point? And that's something that I've been thinking a lot about while I've been here, and I still have a lot of questions about because I really am, I guess, aware of my own position coming in as a foreigner. I don't speak Hindi. I, I have so much to learn about India and the context, and it's just a tricky area to navigate. So I've been trying to kind of figure out how um, people in my position and future interns can, um, can better uh, kind of navigate those difficulties. Um, so, and this is a question actually that I asked the field animators in my, my field office, and I would also love to hear from all of you if you have any um, thoughts or input just how can interns and people who are doing international volunteer work, how can we make sure to be doing this ethically and respectfully, just considering that we're, we're not from here and we, there's so much that we don't know. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any suggestions, please share. Um, these are some of the suggestions that I got from the field. Um, some of them were smaller ways to, I guess, give back, and then others were bigger. Um, but I thought that this was an important thing to share, and it's something that I can maybe share with future interns as well. Um, so I just want to say thank you to um, everyone in the head office, to Archman, and to Costup as well for guiding me and supporting me, and then to the Ajmer Field Office as well, um, who worked with me for the